I practice in Tucson, but actually I just came to Arizona about a year ago. Hmm. And uh, before that, I was in Charleston, South Carolina, where I took care of quite a few patients with cardiac sarcoid. So um, I'm very glad to be here today and to meet some of my colleagues um, at Tucson and Phoenix as we, um, as I kind of get used to the area and um, meet more patients that I will be um, taking care of in the future. So cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, so cardiac sarcoid occurs in about 25% of patients that have sarcoidosis, but the majority of those patients have no symptoms at all. So only 5% of people who have sarcoidosis actually have cardiac sarcoid. And it seems over the last several years that cardiac sarcoid is becoming more common. But physicians wonder though, is it because we're finding it more readily or is it because it actually is occurring more frequently? Part of it is that we are able to diagnose cardiac sarcoid much more easily now. And we're gonna talk about some of the diagnosis and some of the screening tests that we do so you guys can all be familiar <coughs> with that. So the treatment for cardiac um, sarcoidosis is not known in that you'll likely to be treated differently depending on who's taking care of you. We are just now taking a look at the results of this treatment to figure out what the best course of therapy is. All right, so this slide looks a little different than it did before, but you can still see it, I think. So there are differences depending on race in the distribution of sarcoid. And again, like I said, practicing in South Carolina, I saw a lot of patients with cardiac sarcoid. And you can see that if you look at Caucasians versus African Americans or the Japanese, they have about the same incidence. So they're just as likely to have sarcoidosis. But cardiac sarcoid is much more common than Japanese patients. And so that's fascinating to me because we're still unlocking the secrets behind sarcoid and the fact that People from Japan live in a different environment. They probably have different genetic background. It's fascinating. And so you also see that um, the incidence of liver, spleen, and kidney involvement is the same as well. So is the heart different? Probably, somehow. And so it's really an area that I'm glad to be involved in. All right, so if you have sarcoidosis, do you need to worry? Yes. Do you have cardiac sarcoid? And so there are some tests that we do to look for cardiac sarcoid. The first thing is that your doctor will ask you about certain symptoms that you may have. And the first symptom is palpitations. Do you feel like your heart skips a beat? Um, do you ever have a racing heart and feel dizzy? Now, what we call you know, syncope um, is passing out. So have you ever had a passing out spell? Or have you ever had a, pa a near passing out spell where you feel very dizzy, but if you sit down, you're feeling a bit better? So these are symptoms that you should mention to your physician um, because this is something, if they hear this, when we go on to other, other uh, value, forms of evaluation. So the next one's an EKG or an electrocardiogram. I think most of you have probably had an electrocardiogram. It's abnormal though, only in 20 to 30% of patients with sarcoid. <clears throat> and so it's a really easy test to do. You see in this picture, you just lie down stilly and they put all these stickers around you. Um, hook you up to electrodes and take an electrocardiogram. And you're gonna see some electrocardiograms in, in just a little while. If your electrocardiogram is abnormal, we'll do some more testing. But it has a really low sensitivity, so a lot of patients who have cardiac sarcoid, we won't see an abnormal EKG. So the next one's a Holter monitor. So a Holter monitor basically is an EKG that you wear with you. Um, you take it with you. We can do it for different periods of time, 24 hours or 48 hours. Um, sometimes we'll send a whole to monitor home for 30 days so it becomes a close family friend <laughs> at the end of the month. As you can see in this picture, the leads are also like the EKG leads. They get stuck on your body and there's a very small computer that you, work, that you walk around with. The idea is that when you're lying for your EKG, you may not have any abnormalities, but get up and do your regular activities and we might see some rhythm disorders or some, some changes in the heart rhythm. So it's more sensitive. So we'll find cardiac sarcoid if it's there 67% of the time with the Holter monitor. So you can see it's well worth the extra effort to do the Holter. Now, of course, if it's abnormal, we're gonna keep looking. So the next thing is an echocardiogram. So an echocardiogram <coughs> is a sonogram of the heart similar to the sonogram that we do for babies, you know, in, when someone is pregnant. Um, it will be abnormal in 14 to 40% of sarcoid patients. 
And what we look for on the echocardiogram is we look for weakness in the heart muscle. So usually it squeezes about 60%. Is there a decreased squeezing function? Is the heart muscle thick? Because we look, you know, if there are granulomas in the heart muscle, we may see the thickness of the heart muscle. Or is all the heart moving in the same direction? Are there some areas that are affected with granulomas where the heart is not moving the same as the other parts of the heart? So sarcoid can affect the heart in different ways. So let's take a look at this first one. So here is our heart, and we have our left and right ventricle. And you see this area of gray? This is just basal involvement. So this is the type of cardiac sarcoid that you wouldn't have any symptoms from. It's not interfering with anything. We also can see sarcoid where it grows into the septum of the heart. And the reason why the septum of the heart is important is that when the heart beats, it's told to beat from the atrium way up here, and then the, electric the electricity goes down through this part of the heart and tells the rest of the heart to beat. Mm -hmm. And so some of the abnormalities we see in cardiac sarcoid are because of blockages in the septum there. The next one you can see here, we have um, disease here in the septum, but also now disease on the left ventricle wall. Now, like I mentioned, the electricity comes from the top down that middle to the sides. If you have infiltration or if you have granulomas here, you can, you can develop rhythms that instead of going in one direction, all of a sudden start going in many directions. And that can cause irregular heartbeats and can decrease the function of the heart muscle. So I'm actually a heart failure specialist. So the patients that I see with cardiac sarcoid usually have fairly advanced cardiac sarcoid and they've developed the weakness of the heart muscle. And I also am a um, mechanical heart pump and a heart transplant doctor. And so that's how I get involved in this. So my patients, uh, by the time they are referred to me, have disease all throughout their heart. So how do we diagnose cardiac sarcoid? So if we see it on a heart biopsy, we've got it. We know that it's there. But as you've heard already, it may not be necessary to do a heart biopsy to diagnose cardiac sarcoid. But let's talk about heart biopsy. It sounds kind of daunting, doesn't it? So, and I know this because I do heart transplant. And so whenever I'm sitting and talking with my patients who are going to have a heart transplant, I say, well, we're going to give you this new heart, but afterwards we have to make sure there's not rejection. So basically what we're gonna do is take your heart back from you about one piece at a time, because <laughs> we know. Um, so a heart biopsy. So a heart biopsy is actually done in the catheterization lab, which looks like an operating room. We take our patients in and we clean the neck, because we use a jugular vein for heart biopsy. We clean the, the neck with special soap and then pass a needle into that jugular vein. And then over that needle, we pass a hollow tube that we call a sheath. And we actually have a special Biotome. So it's a special, um, I don't know how to, how to describe it, but it's, a, it's a, um, a device that we use that goes to the jugular vein and we use um, fluoroscopy or echo actually, I you like to use echo, um, and move this biotome all the way to the septum. Remember that area in the middle of the heart that had the circle? We go to that septum and we take some pieces here. So we go all the way to the jugular vein to take some pieces in the right ventricle. And so this is what heart looks like underneath the microscope. And so you can see that there are fibers, and the fibers are what contract. And those fibers typically are, you know, all line up well. But you can see here the granulomas. So we had a cartoon of the granulomas before, and here's what it looks like under the microscope. So the granulomas are inflammation. And inflammation tries to heal, just like um, a wound that we have when we cut ourselves um, with a kitchen knife. And what happens is that the healing causes fibrosis. And this is an example of an area of fibrosis in a heart that has, um, that has cardiac sarcoid. And so the fibrosis, it's scar, so it doesn't contract the way that normal heart does. And that's why we see the heart weakness in cardiac sarcoid. <laughs> Unfortunately, and one of the reasons why we don't always biopsy someone is that it's patchy. So what happens if I go in there with my biotone and I take part of the heart that doesn't have a granuloma in it? And so we can miss it, even though we're taking heart tissue. But if we see it, then we absolutely know that it's there. And we can say, yes, I know, I'm sorry, these drugs, the steroids and the other medications are really difficult to take, but I can see the granulomas there. And that's the reason why we go through the trouble of treating. 
But let's talk about other ways. So let's say that you've had a biopsy of your skin or a biopsy of your lung and we know that you have sarcoid. Then you only need one of these other factors for us to say for sure that you have cardiac sarcoid. The first is heart failure. So there are two different types of heart failure we see in patients that have cardiac sarcoid. And there are, this is called diastolic heart failure or heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. These hearts are squeezing normally, but because of the granulomas, the walls get really thick. And so even though it's squeezing 60%, the hole that the blood's flowing into is only half the volume as it should be. And so that can really affect symptoms. The second is systolic heart failure, which you see on the right-hand side of the slide. This is when the heart is weak, when the ejection fraction, instead of 60%, let's say it's 30%. So the heart has to be twice as fast to move the same amount of blood. What kind of symptoms that you have if you have heart failure? So my patients commonly say that they feel short of breath. And I ask them, what kind of activities can you not do because you're short of breath? And they'll say, well, it's really hard for me to carry my groceries into the house or it's difficult for me to climb a flight of stairs without stopping. Particularly, they have shortness of breath when they lie down to go to sleep at night and find that propping themselves up with pillows really helps. Swelling in the legs or swelling in the abdomen. Also, um, just that fatigue that Dr. Knox described. So not sleepiness, but just a fatigue, a dreariness of trying to get around. <coughs> the second thing that if we find we can make a diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis is abnormal heart electrical activity. So here's an example. The first is heart block. And so if you can imagine, I said that the heart starts beating from the top of the heart, that's called the P wave. And so you see these first beats? These are the atrial beats. And then it goes from the atrium through the septum and then causes contraction of the left and right ventricle. And that's this part of this EKG. So this person has an atrial beat and it beats in the ventricles. Then there's a long wait, atrial beat, and now this time it takes longer to get to ventricles. Hmm. Even longer to get to ventricles, and here it doesn't get to the ventricle at all. And so you can imagine that the patient would have um, symptoms when those hearts are skipping a beat. And that's the palpitations, the feeling that the heart's skipping a beat. The second thing that happen, can happen, I showed you the picture when the scars get into the wall, the left ventricular wall and it doesn't go straight, it goes around in circles. This is an example of the electricity going around in a circle, where you have a normal EKG here, and then all of a sudden, it just goes into crazy there. This is called ventricular tachycardia, and this heartbeat is so fast that you don't have enough blood flow at all, and this is when you feel like you're gonna pass out, when you have a ventricular tachycardia. Here, this is what we call non-sustained, and so there's just a handful of beats here, but this can also be sustained. And this is something that if you have, your doctor is going to talk to you about a pacemaker. So next, so these are a few imaging studies that we can do. So this is, instead of a biopsy, let's take a look at the whole heart. And we can do that two different ways. The first way is actually the best way, um, which is to do a PET scan, a cardiac PET scan. So we just call it PET. I don't even know if I remember uh, that it's posit positron emission tomography, but we call it PET scan. So a cardiac PET scan. So how do we do a cardiac PET? How does that work? Well, there are a few things that you need to prepare for a cardiac PET. And basically what we do is we tag glucose, which is sugar, um, with a radioactive sub substance. And so before your PET scan, you're not allowed to eat any carbohydrates. You can eat, and it's better if you eat lots of fat and a lot of protein. Nothing to eat eight hours before your PET scan. So we inject into your body this glucose that has the radioactive substance, and the heart starves the glucose. So as soon as you get that injection, it goes to parts of the heart that are contracting well. Um, and so here you see a PET scan that lights up. So the glucose ran to these areas that had granulomas. And you can see it's affecting a lot of different places in the body. But this is the granuloma that's in the heart. Now this patient actually received steroid, steroids for their cardiac sarcoid. And they had another PET scan. And this is what it looked like after steroids. So, not only pets, are PET scans helpful for making a diagnosis, but can also show us that the treatment is working. Now, it is actually the best test to diagnose cardiac sarcoid. We can find it about <coughs> nine out of 10 times. And so that's extremely helpful. But sometimes, you know, because of my experience on the guy, I know this patient has definitely got cardiac sarcoid. They have a weak heart muscle and they have 
a known pulmonary sarcoid. So even if the PET scan is normal, and I have a really strong suspicion that cardiac sarcoid is there, that's when my patients get things like a follow-up biopsy or other testing done. And mainly that's just when we're making tough decisions about treatment. So finally is a cardiac MRI. So we all heard probably about MRIs now. We may have had MRIs of other parts of our body, but we can actually do a cardiac MRI. It's important that if you have an MRI or a PET scan, it's done in a lab that knows what sees sarcoid patients and has special protocols for this. Um, the MRI basically is a magnetic energy and actually all of our cells, especially our electrical cells in our body, are like magnets. And so what happens is that we put this strong magnet on you and all of the cells line up in a certain direction. And then the magnet goes away and the cells relax to their random state. And depending on what type of cell you have, that relaxation happens at a different, different time. And so what we can do is we can take pictures like this. We can take pictures of the heart. And so this is the blood in the heart. The white part is the blood and the black part is the heart muscle. But we shouldn't see this other white area in the heart muscle. And so that's the cardiac sarcoid. And then we can actually do the infusion and do the same thing, but this is like a hybrid study. We can see it lights up really bright for us. So it can be hard to tell the white from the black here, but it's really obvious to see the, the hot spots. So what about treatment for cardiac sarcoid? So we know that if we take patients, yeah, I can point here, you can't see if I point on that screen in front of me. Um, so if we take patients that have a normal ejection fraction and treat them with steroids, we see that it doesn't make much of a, a difference before and after cardiac, um, after steroids. But if you have a patient that has an ejection fraction less than 50% and treat them, we see a much significant improvement with steroid therapy. It's important though that we treat patients early with cardiac sarcoid. Remember when we saw the granulomas and then later they turned into the scar, the fibrosis? <laughs> One thing that we have found out that if the cardiac sarcoid has been there for a long period of time, it's much better to treat it and we have a, likely, a better likelihood of healing the heart if we treat with steroids early. And also, when you have a weak heart muscle, we get to give you all the same treatments we give to any patient that has a weak heart muscle. And those medications as well can heal the heart. So prognosis and treatment. I mentioned before, if you have significant electrical abnormalities in your heart, it will raise a pacemaker. We know that a lot of patients are progressing to heart failure. We're seeing more patients with heart failure. And we know that if you do have heart failure, we have a prognosis of just like any of our heart failure patients, whether you've had a heart attack before or you have other diseases of your heart muscle. So the, the most common cause of, of a short or a poor prognosis in sarcoid is actually cardiac involvement. So one good news though, is that our numbers, the number of patients with cardiac sarcoid who've gotten heart transplant has increased fivefold from the 1990s to the 2000s. And so we are recognizing that heart transplant is an option and that our patients do quite well with their sarcoid after heart transplant because we use really strong immunosuppressants. So I think that the, this foundation and meetings like this where in a different format than in the, than the um, examination room to be able to learn and ask questions is really important. And what I've seen over my career is that there's a lot more discussion going on about sarcoid and cardiac sarcoid, and I think that's very positive. And so I thank you all for being here today. And